Hi, and welcome. These are a series of notes on Michel Macarius' book titled Ruins. The book focuses on visual art's relationship to, and depictions of ruins mainly within Western culture. I'll take a focused look on concepts and ideas that seemed interesting within the fourth chapter from the text. However, I won't go through all of the content within the chapter itself. If you find the content in this recording interesting, you're welcome to follow along as I create a new one for each section. I'll also have a link to the book itself in the description. The section I'll take a look at is titled In the Shades of Time. This chapter is a bit long, so I'm going to be breaking it down into two sections. From the previous chapter, I'll reframe this section's notes mostly to around the 1700s, although there's a little bit of wiggle room in that time frame. Beginning in around the 1700s, we begin this section by connecting the notions of ruins to overarching ideas of the sublime. The sublime, during this time period, is in many ways an acknowledgement of the violent and destructive forces of nature. The apex of the sublime is the catastrophe. This might include both the moment of disaster as well as moments either leading up to or after an event of that magnitude. This includes events like hurricanes, volcano eruptions, and earthquakes, to name a few. One of the biggest distinctions here is that the destruction is always completely from nature and its uncontrollable and boundless destructive forces. The sublime, in many ways, opposes these previously mentioned positionings in art that focused on balance, harmony, and the classical, or on destruction as something relating to religious narratives. There's a sense of terror and, at times, rapid movement and dread in many, though not all, works created with the sublime in mind. Annie Lebrun sums this up really well on page 84. It reads as such. European sensibility was invaded by the depiction of imagery, imaginary disasters whose essential characteristic is to conjure up catastrophe in its purest state, disentangling it from its religious references, as if the primary aim of the recourse to the imaginary is to liberate the mind so that it can begin to think differently. Replacing classic representations of the flood and the traditional image of the apocalypse came innumerable pictures of storms, shipwrecks, tempests, volcanoes, tidal waves, each one less realistic than the next, as if to figure in the disproportion of their imaginings the impossibility of confronting an ever-receding sense of meaning. The text con continues as such. The notion of the sublime, in which various layers of 18th century sensibility coalesce, ricochets off that of force. In the meaning that the term had for Newton when he discovered universal gravitation, in other words, the world is in a relationship of tension seemingly governed by an interplay between attraction and repulsion. The sublime ought thus to be understood as the aesthetic and psychological expression of a fundamental principle. Man and nature are subjected to conflicting forces. Often the sublime is viewed as something connected to the beautiful as well as the awe-inspiring. This comes from the positioning of the viewer. Someone who is comfortable and safe in a room viewing an image or representation of chaos and destruction has in some way surmounted or survived chaos and a higher power than one's self. Essentially, someone or their ancestors live to fight another day and to continually improve their standard of living and safety. Ultimately, this has a secondary connotation of not just surviving, but thriving afterwards. Although there's 
more depth and complexity to this definition. For the purposes of this recording, I'm going to leave it as such so that we can move forward a bit. Where does this idea leave us in terms of ruins? During this time period, it was common to reposition the ruin as an aesthetic object. Often these depictions were specific to sites such as palaces, elaborate tombs, public monuments, and so on. Rustic and middle-class dwellings, for example, were not part of this definition of ruins and were instead referred to as ruined buildings. The philosopher and sociologist George Simmel held a position about ruins with regards to the sublime that positions it between nature and culture. Put simply, Simmel sees two positions for the ruin. One is the constant erecting and constructing by humans. The other is the absorbing and flattening of these structures by nature. The end result of one is verticality, and the other is horizontality. Simmel writes, But this unique balance between mechanical matter that weighs down, that passively opposes thrust, and the mind that fashions that surges upward evaporates the moment a building collapses. Through ruins, we can feel the vitality of those opposing energies, and beyond any formal or aesthetic dimension, it is by intrinsically sensing these oppositions in ourselves that we are able to revel in the deep significance of some silhouette in whose tranquility they are conjoined. Underlying all of this is a sentiment that privileges human creativity and persistence um, over nature as a force. As a final note, during this time there is quite a bit of monstrous imagery as well. It isn't uncommon, for instance, to see combinations of ruins and bodies without skin in the same image, either for reasons connecting them to the sublime, or relating enlightenment through emerging scientific discoveries to representations of innovation and in, in light, enlightened uh, thought from the past. Page 89 also has an interesting quote. It reads as such. Paradoxically, in the middle of the enlightenment, there flickers an attraction for shadows, for blackness, for the tenebras. This obsession with darkness and horror during the Enlightenment opened the imaginings of the likes of Marquis de Chade and Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Well, that's it for this uh, section of uh, Chapter 4 of Macarius's book, Ruins. In the next recording, I'll cover the second half of this section. If you like this content, please like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, th thanks for listening.